The most archetypical rat worldwide is the black rat, scientific name Rattus ratus, followed closely by the brown rat, scientific name Rattus norvegicus. These two rats are sometimes referred to as old world rats, or true rats, in part to distinguish them from other small mammals that are rat-like and which have rat in the name sometimes, but which are nonetheless not technically rats like the North American pack rat or wood rat, the broadly defined collection of species referred to as the kangaroo rat, and the bandicoot rat, which is a rodent most commonly found across Asia. Also superficially similar to true rats, the brown and black rat, mice are what's called a sister group to rats, a relationship we were only able to establish for certain after a 2009 study called Rodent Phylogeny Revised. Analysis of Six Nuclear Genes from All Major Rodent Clades. This sister grouping means that rats and mice are each other's closest biological relative, and it's estimated that they evolutionarily separated from each other, meaning they diverged into separate distinct species from a common ancestor about 12 to 24 million years ago. Which is interesting, considering that it's thought that the primate lineage only separated from the rodent lineage, again we split from a common ancestor, about 80 million years ago. One of the more visually distinctive traits of the rat, its often longish, pinkish tail, is thought to serve three main purposes. First is that it allows the rat to thermoregulate, to adjust its temperature by dissipating heat, by carrying blood from the rest of its body, especially the most active and warm portions of the body, to the vein-dense tail, where the heat can then radiate outward from the blood through the tail skin into the air. Second, the tail seems to play a role in the rat's ability to ascertain its place in three dimensions, and its position relative to the world around it. Different animals do this in different ways, but it would seem that for the rat, its tail plays at least a partial role in helping it stay upright, walk without bumping into things, and maintain equilibrium. And third, the rat's tail serves as what's called a degloving defense mechanism, which is something we see more frequently in reptiles and amphibians, like newts and other lizards, but which is also found in other creatures. Some newts, when attacked, can decouple their tails, allowing the tail, still wriggling, to pop right off, which in some cases allows them to escape the jaws of a predator that has grabbed them by their backmost mass, grabbed them by the tail as they were fleeing from that predator. Rats do something similar, but rather than separating from their whole tail, they have an outer layer on the tail that can slide off, essentially shedding the top part of the skin so that predators who grab them by the tail end up with just a tail skin sheath in their mouths while the rat scurries away. Beyond those tail-related evolutions, rats have also evolved to be highly omnivorous, and I mean that in the dietary sense, but also in essentially every other possible sense. They will eat just about anything, and their digestive systems have evolved to allow them to do so and to survive. They can extract nutrients from the most non-nutritious seeming things when they have to, and they will gladly eat the rubbish left behind by other animals, especially humans who leave behind so very much of it. They'll also gladly feast on plants, other animals, those animals' eggs. They are infamous for their ability to gobble through an area's resources, whatever those resources might be and for a very high birth rate, which can result in a small number of rats becoming a very large number of rats in a very short period of time. That growth fueled by all of that gobbling. Rats can also live just about anywhere, and they do. They live on every single continent except Antarctica, and it's a fair bet that they will eventually live there too. The only thing keeping them from doing so now, as far as we know at least, is the very cold average temperature that kills them if they don't have shelter. And there are relatively few and small human habitations down there at the moment, which keeps rats from hiding out in walls and building foundations and in abandoned buildings, of which there are not many. So when they do make it there, they are noticed fairly quickly. 
which is not the case on other continents. Due to their ability to dog paddle their way to land if they end up in the ocean, and their ability to eat whatever wherever they end up, from the human age of exploration onward, rats have been scattered to the wind, ending up where we decided to settle, but also washing up to shore on tiny islands, often out-surviving and out-eating all the local flora and fauna. It's estimated that 40 to 60 percent of seabird and reptile extinctions are the fault of rats that washed up on their turf, ate all their stuff, and either starved them to death or just ate them and their eggs, until there were no longer any of them left to eat. In this way, rats behave sort of like an opportunistic virus, and thus it's somewhat fitting that they are also such highly effective zoonotic, meaning animal-carried, vectors for disease. That said, much of the association between rats and disease is a little unfair. The rat's affiliation with the Black Death Plague, for instance, is more correctly attributed to fleas than rats. And honestly, rats often cause the most trouble, with disease and otherwise, when they ride shotgun with humans, who travel around the world and leave semi-nutritious trash all over the place. So if rats are a plague, then by some definitions we are too. Or at the very least, we are the plague spreaders. Throughout history, up through today though, despite their at times bad reputation, humans have kept rats as companions. In some cases as working animals, sniffing for bombs and gunpowder, tracking down landmines, working as therapy animals, but also just as pets, like you might adopt a cat or a dog. And many of the reasons rats are considered to be such pests, their cleverness in overcoming human-deployed obstacles, meant to keep them from trash bins and from getting into homes, for instance, are the same reasons people enjoy having them around as companions. They seem to be quite smart, though that term becomes a little bit tricky to quantify, even when discussing humans, much less animals. But they do seem to have the capacity to learn, to adjust to different ways of being, and to demonstrate a sort of care and compassion that we see throughout the animal kingdom, but of a more specific kind that seems to be particularly reflective of human compassion. This is something that we see in many different types of primates and rodents, but rats are very much a part of that at times strangely human-seeming category. Of course, we don't know enough to know a whole lot about the inner lives of animals, much less what those inner lives might be like. There's a chance that we're just personifying non-human traits in such animals, because that's what we do with pretty much everything. Something we can say with more certainty, though, is that rats, when left to spread unabated, behave in a very human fashion. They use up all the available resources in a region, and in doing so, devastate many other species in the area. Not out of malice, but because they consume, 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 so they can grow, grow, grow. And that propensity has led to the extinction of a great many species around the world, both historically and contemporarily, as we've watched and documented and wondered what we might do about it. What I'd like to talk about today is what some governments are doing about it, and what some proposed solutions might look like, in theory and in practice. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. If you are finding some value in Let's Know Things, consider becoming a supporter you can do so directly, monetarily, by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. You can help out by sharing the show with a friend, somebody who you think might enjoy it, or with your social network of choice. You can leave a quick review up on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Or you can check out one of the other contribution options at letsknowthings.com. A huge thanks to everybody who is already helping to support the show in some way, shape, or form. You are the reason I am able to commit the time that I do to the show each week, and that means a whole lot. Thank you very much. All right, let's get back to the show. New Zealand is a strange and beautiful place. I personally lived in Christchurch in New Zealand for a while, and have road-tripped both North and South islands of the country. It's almost unfairly gorgeous there, and a lot of that beauty comes from the strange proportions of the landscape, 
the mountains, the beaches, things like that. But there's also a calmness and almost friendliness to the wildlife there. And that's partially aesthetic perception, I'm sure, but it's also kind of a known property of these islands' ecologies. Nature in New Zealand serves as kind of a counterpoint to nature in Australia, where everything is poisonous and venomous and wants to kill and eat you. In New Zealand, there are very few harmful animals, and of those, most have been introduced by humans. They were not native to the area when the first settlers, Polynesians who became known as the Maori, arrived. So some of these creatures came with them, and some came later, when first Dutch explorers, and later British colonizers, stopped by and set up shop. Before humans arrived, though, New Zealand was geographically isolated from the rest of the world, from all other land masses, for about 80 million years, which if you recall from the intro, was approximately the same time period in which primates and rodents split off from our shared ancestor. So it had been a while since New Zealand wildlife had encountered anything from elsewhere. This means that New Zealandic flora and fauna evolved in isolation for a very long time, leading to an ecosystem that is rich and lush and interesting, but also quite fragile to outside influence. The animals, fungi, and plants in New Zealand are wildly divergent from those found elsewhere, and a great many of them, about 82% of plants and 40% of fungi, based on the most recent available numbers, are found in New Zealand and just New Zealand, which is quite unusual even for island ecosystems, which often have their own distinct wildlife. There are also numerous distinctive species of birds in New Zealand, which flourished in the local forests, which covered about 80% of land on the islands before the Polynesians showed up and began to deforest the area. And those birds are striking in their diversity and unusualness. Many of these birds only evolved the way they did, though, only survived with their unique, often guileless properties because of the lack of local mammalian predators. There are frogs and insects and snails, there are living fossil-style reptiles called tuatara, and there are numerous flightless birds, ranging from the famously adorable and harmless kiwi to the less famous, but also quite adorable and mostly harmless, kakapu, weka, and Takahi, all tottering through the ground-based foliage, not needing the ability to fly away, fight, or even run particularly well, because nothing was down there chasing them. When the Maori's Polynesian ancestors arrived, there were also a large number of moa in New Zealand, a large flightless bird that looked a bit like, and that were related to, African ostriches. They were massive, up to around 12 feet or 3.6 meters tall and they ran rather than flying. Their wings were kind of an evolutionary afterthought. These massive birds were hunted to extinction by the newly arrived humans, though, which in turn led to the extinction of the Host's eagle, which was an absolutely huge flying bird of prey, the largest known to have existed ever, though it had a relatively small wingspan for its size, around 8.5 feet or 2.6 meters in width which would have helped them hunt without bumping into the abundant trees of New Zealand's then all-encompassing forests. But despite their relatively moderate wingspan, they were quite long and very heavy for birds, about 4 feet 7 inches or 1.4 meters long, and over 30 pounds, which is about 14 kilograms, in heft. So the giant ostrich-like bird was hunted to extinction by humans, mammoth style, and the monster bird that was so big and scary it became a part of Maori mythology then also died out because it was lacking its chosen prey, those giant land-based birds. And both of these species died out sometime around 1400 CE, leaving a pair of islands that were then occupied by primarily small, cute birds and some bugs and reptiles and a single, harmless mammal, a thumb-sized bat. A great many other extinctions also happened as a consequence of the Maori arriving, but not at the Maori's hands. Their Polynesian ancestors migrated to New Zealand sometime between 1250 and 1300 CE, and with them came Kiori, the Polynesian rat, which, by the way, is the third most widespread species of rat in the world after the brown and black rat in large part because the Polynesians were such incredibly skilled and prolific explorers and these little rats tagged along on their journeys. 
These Polynesian rats gobbled their way through numerous local species, from frogs to lizards to birds, and then when the Europeans showed up with their own rats in tow, along with cats, stoats, weasels, and ferrets, the diversity of animals shrunk dramatically and quickly in New Zealand. The native birds, about a quarter of which are estimated to have been wiped out thus far, and the other friendly, defenseless wildlife on these islands just didn't know what to do. They had not evolved many survival traits because they'd never had to cope with mammalian predators before, much less mammalian predators as clever, versatile, and omnivorous as rats. That historical groundwork in place. The article I'd like to start with today comes from The Atlantic, and it's entitled, New Zealand's War on Rats Could Change the World. This piece was written by Ed Yong, who, in addition to being the author of an incredibly well-written and thoughtful book on the microbiome entitled I Contain Multitudes, is also an amazing overall science writer. This article of his is a few years old, from 2017, but it addresses a few topics that have been in the news recently from a perspective that I find to be a bit more useful and interesting than most pieces that cover the same. And despite the years that have passed, it's still fairly up-to-date and absolutely relevant to what is happening today in 2019. The piece is about New Zealand's rat situation, rat and ferret and stoat and other invasive mammalian predator situation, actually, and how they, the New Zealand government, have tried and are trying to address that issue. And when I say address it, I mostly mean how they are trying to kill all the rats and other predatory mammals that live in New Zealand. There's a grassroots organized government-funded plan called Predator Free 2050 that has been doing research into how best to kill all the rats, possums, and stoats in New Zealand by the year 2050. This includes micro-scale efforts like helping people set up rat traps in their backyards, but also larger-scale efforts like blanketing woodland areas with rat poison and putting up walls around areas that can then be more easily and reliably kept free of predators, giving local animals a chance to flourish the way they did before the humans and their accompanying predatory mammals arrived back in the day. One such enclosed area, called Zealandia, is fairly well-developed at this point, having been funded by a trust, but also generating revenue to support itself by selling access to the public to come see what the area might have looked like before humans showed up and started changing things. From Zealandia's promotional materials, quote, Zealandia is the world's first fully fenced urban eco-sanctuary, with an extraordinary 500-year vision to restore a Wellington Valley's forest and freshwater ecosystems as closely as possible to their pre-human state. The 225-hectare eco-sanctuary is a groundbreaking conservation project that has reintroduced over 20 species of native wildlife back into the area, some of which were previously absent from mainland New Zealand for over 100 years." End quote. This notion, that of Zealandia, but also of the Predator-Free 2050 program, is wildly ambitious. The only island on the planet that has managed to do what New Zealand is trying to do is Macquarie Island, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, so a location that has been recognized as having some kind of cultural or historic importance, and thus some place worth protecting, which is also a small island located about halfway between New Zealand and Antarctica that's governed by Tasmania, which itself is part of Australia. So the climate and geography of the island is already quite different from New Zealand's climate and geography, but the kicker is that Macquarie Island is only about one two-thousandth the size of New Zealand. And even on Macquarie, with those relatively more favorable conditions in terms of wiping things out if you want to, the effort to eradicate mammalian predators was not a walk in the park. Macquarie Island was discovered by accident in mid-1810 by an Australian Briton sealer, a seal hunter, who was looking for fresh hunting grounds. He claimed the island for Britain and gave it to New South Wales that same year. And over the course of the next century, 144 ships recorded having visited the island. Twelve of them were wrecked while visiting, and those who did land and leave without wrecking hunted the local seals and penguins to near extinction. And then from 1902 until 1920, the island was leased to an oil magnate, which at the time meant oil harvested from blubber and fat from animals, not petroleum-based oil, 
who set up a base and essentially processed, harvested the local penguins to turn their fat into oil. There were a few research stations on the island around that same time, but in 1933, Tasmanian authorities declared the island a wildlife sanctuary. The island was tricky to maintain as an ecological protectorate, though, because of the island's many encounters with ships from all over the world. The government intended to protect the local flora and fauna, which were quite unique and interesting, and which were a significant part of why it was considered to be so culturally and historically valuable. But those ships had introduced non-native creatures to the island over the years, and those creatures had gone wild, taking advantage of the easy prey that the evolutionarily isolated local penguins, seals, and birds made for. Rats and mice were introduced to the island with the earliest of known human visitors back in 1810. Then cats were introduced, intentionally, to help kill the rats and mice and keep them from eating the food stores maintained by local oil traders. Around 1870, rabbits were introduced and allowed to breed freely with the intention of having them serve as wild available food sources for future visitors. But the rabbits bred like rabbits, and the cats did too, the former gobbling up all the local foliage, leading to erosion and then rock slides, some of which destroyed local penguin breeding grounds, and the latter fed on local seabirds alongside the mice and rats that they were introduced to control. In the 1980s, the government tried to lower the cat population, culling, meaning killing, several thousand, which did lessen the overall damage caused by cats for a time, but which also led to an increase in the number of rats and rabbits, which did even more damage to the native plants and animals than before. They then tried to kill off the rabbits by introducing a type of pox, a type of disease, that was fairly successful at eliminating just the rabbits and nothing else, but their numbers rebounded as soon as the pox was no longer introduced intentionally by the humans. And at this point, those tasked with doing the protecting could not figure out a way to limit one pest without increasing the potency of one of the other pests. In mid-2007, the Australian government decided to fund an effort to handle all of these predators simultaneously in a last-ditch effort to protect the island's value as a World Heritage Site before all the local flora and fauna were killed. They spent an estimated 24 million Australian dollars to conduct mass baiting programs, meaning they planted poisoned bait around the island in hopes of spreading the poison to larger populations of rats and cats and rabbits. And then after the poison had been left to do its business for a while, they sent in dog hunting teams on a regular basis over a period of seven years to kill off any surviving human-introduced predators. By early 2012, it was reported that the program had been a success, and all of the rabbits, rats, and mice had been killed off, at least to the point where they were no longer an ecological threat, though about a dozen surviving rabbits were later found by dog teams and killed. This effort on Macquarie Island is considered to be the most successful pest eradication program ever conducted, but again, it was anything but a straight line from A to B. And again, New Zealand is 2,000 times the size of Macquarie, with a somewhat more favorable life-sustaining climate in terms of creatures like rats being able to survive in the wild. So what worked in one location very likely will not directly translate to the other. Zealandia, though, that walled ecology, demonstrates one model that might be utilized to create smaller, more controllable patches of land within the larger expanse of New Zealand which would allow the government to, little by little, create pockets of predator-free ecologies. This, in turn, could help them protect the dwindling populations of native species that are still around, that they're hoping to keep from going the way of the moa and the host's eagle, and the many other local species that have now disappeared forever. This problem with rats and other predatory creatures, but especially rats because of their omnivorousness, cleverness, and resiliency, is not just a New Zealand and tiny southern island issue. A recent piece in Hakai magazine, entitled The Rat Spill, tells the story of rats invading an Alaskan island, and around the Arctic more broadly. And throughout history, we have seen wildlife ranging from pigs to fruiting plants introduced to new areas by humans for various purposes, in some cases because we want them around as pets or to make a new home feel like our old home, but in some cases because they helped feed us or clothe us or allowed us to learn more about biology and the world. Other invasive species are introduced by accident, as is often the case with the rats, 
and with some types of barnacles that cling to ships, and forest-demolishing beetles that cross human-defined borders tucked amongst freshly cut tree branches and on the backs of trucks, still others travel of their own accord because of a change in their familiar environment, because of overpopulation pressures, or to pursue fresh opportunities to feed or mate elsewhere. One possible solution to the myriad problems that arise when an invasive species arrives in a new location, upsetting the local ecosystem and causing untold numbers of problems as a consequence, is to adjust the nature of that species so they are no longer a problem. Using gene modification tools like CRISPR-Cas9, which could, in theory, allow us to do a find-and-replace command on the DNA of representatives of a certain species before releasing them back into the wild, allowing them to spread that genetic change, could, in turn, eventually, make all mosquitoes of a certain type, in a certain area, infertile. Or it could potentially make all rats in a particular area toxic to fleas, maybe making them less of a vector for diseases that could then go on to infect humans. There are a lot of maybes and possiblies with this type of plan, though, as the applications of CRISPR-Cas9 and similar genetic tools are mostly theoretical right now, at least in practice and at least as of the day I'm recording this in September of 2019. But that could change very soon. We are approaching a moment in time in which it may be both feasible and practical to undertake such a project, and there are already experiments being conducted to figure out whether this application of this technology might help us destroy or diminish the populations of malaria-carrying mosquitoes that plague parts of Africa. If successful, such approaches, making a species infertile but attractive to mates so they go through the motions of procreation, but generation by generation their populations get smaller, might then be applied to other pests, like rats and rabbits and whatever else we don't want to see, infringing upon a particular ecosystem. There are moral questions to be answered here, of course, alongside the practical ones. It's not just whether or not we can do this thing, it's whether we should. Should we risk that something might go wrong, that we might permanently alter a species worldwide in unforetold ways, just so that we can more easily control their populations in some specific areas? Should we risk accidentally doing too well, causing a species to go completely extinct because that species hurts us or other creatures in some particular place? Should we risk some food webs falling apart because we want to reduce the damage that these creatures cause, perhaps causing more of a different sort of damage in the trade-off? We also, very importantly, need to ask ourselves how we should determine which species should be in which areas, and what we do when they cross over, and what it even means to cross over from one area to another into areas that are almost always defined in some way by humans, not by nature. Cats, for instance, are not currently being targeted in New Zealand, despite also being a contributor to the destruction of certain types of local flightless bird. This superficially makes sense, People tend to feel more positively toward cats, on average, than rats. But it's also indicative of the fact that this sorting, this culling, this purification, is not an absolute thing. They are making a conscious choice to exclude some pests and include others. So there's no one correct way to set up an ecosystem. Even when we say we want it to be like it was at a certain point in history, there are still exceptions and deviations to be found in such seemingly clean-cut plans. Also, this approach, the decision to eliminate certain creatures to protect other creatures, using historical precedent as the motive, ignores the fact that cats are still there. Humans are still there. Not to mention the many, many plants and bugs and fungi and other creatures that have moved in over the past few centuries. We can say, then, that we want to get rid of some of the most pernicious and ecologically devastating creatures that have moved in, but to claim that we are setting back the clock more holistically or completely is a little disingenuous. There's also the more philosophical issue of how we determine what the good and correct and moral ecological setup for a particular region is. In many such cases, we look at how an ecology was arranged before humans arrived and decide that that setup, the pre-human setup, the immediately pre-human setup, as best as we can remember it at least, was good and pure and excellent and the best. But, first off, as I just mentioned, we are not good at knowing such things with any amount of resolution, and we are generally willing to bend on things 
like allowing humans to live in these supposedly non-human ecologies, along with our more cherished pets. But also, nature is not fixed. It's not stagnant. It doesn't hold still like a museum. It is a video, not a photograph. And in a lot of cases, what we're trying to do here is make that landscape, that ecology, seem like a photograph, behave like a photograph. Part of the goal here, then, seems to be the establishment of an ostensibly wild ecosystem, correct because it's based on a pre-human ecology that is defined, built, controlled, and protected by humans, which is not an inherently wrong or inherently right thing to do, but it's also not natural in the same way that a species dying off or surviving by changing when a new predator moves in and easily kills it and its young is natural. In nature, species that do not compete die, regardless of how the predator that's doing the killing got there. What we're doing then is stepping in and saying this creature or this ecosystem is important enough for whatever reason, scientific, historic, aesthetic, it's important enough to protect. It's important enough to us that we will defy nature to keep it as unchanged as possible from how it was at a particular point in history before other variables stepped in and adjusted it, subtly or dramatically. It's important to recognize that this is what we're doing, to be honest with ourselves about it, and to realize that we could just as easily do this with ecologies from any other time frame throughout history. We're in some ways attempting to enforce a time-specific ecological status quo based on a bias that we have, that things that existed right before humans came in are better, better than what happened after humans came in, and better than what happened a thousand years before that. We could, alternatively, decide that it is good and correct to have lions roaming the flatlands of England, or that mammoths must be reborn and reintroduced to North America. We could go back further. We could do dinosaurs. We could do pig lizards. We could decide that the Great Barrier Reef is meant to be colorful and vibrant and flourish, or we could decide that it is better off as the pale white dying iteration that we see today that is changing into a new and different type of habitat, a habitat that allows the crown of thorn, sea star, among other so-called invasive species that have moved in to devour the remnants of the past, we could decide that that is the correct habitat and they are the correct inhabitants instead. We could decide that what we currently call invasive species are actually the new correct inhabitants and that whatever comes next to eat or kill them are the true invaders. Or we could set back the clock super far, and we can look at what was there right before humans arrived, and recognize that they were the invaders, they were the invasive species for some other species that came before them. We can, and almost certainly will, recalibrate our views about such places in this way, depending on who's in charge, what's convenient, and what we value in a particular time and place. Today's biases in this regard, are based on today's variables and based on the people who live in these different places today. And again, there's no right or wrong way to behave here. There's no correct or incorrect choice to be made. I'm merely suggesting that we acknowledge that we recognize this, because as we develop more and more powerful tools that allow us to make these types of changes, whether we're talking about hunting and poisoning certain species on an island, or terraforming an entire planet to make it more Earth-like, more suitable for us and our most favorite ecosystems. It's important that we're able to define our motivations and understand why we are drawing the line where we are drawing it, deciding what version of a place is right and which is wrong, which is the correct arrangement of creatures and which is the malicious invader that must be stopped. Go back far enough in our planet's history and all of our environments, every single ecosystem was wildly different from how it is today. Change is natural, but also quite natural is humanity messing around with things to serve different purposes. And some of those purposes, by some ideologies, some moral standpoints, might supersede the will of nature. That may or may not be okay depending on who you are and what those purposes are and what period in time you happen to be living in. Our goal then, ideally, should probably be assessing and growing our capabilities in this regard to make sure that we can do these things well if and when we choose to do them, while also becoming an increasingly self-aware and responsible species, capable of protecting 
when warranted, and doing so with skill, but also being capable of allowing nature to take its course when warranted, ideally in the context of us doing overall less harm, so that we feel less directly responsible for the often brutal-seeming aspects of the giant superorganism, the planet, and its many interconnected ecosystems, of which we are an interconnected part. If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. You can also support my work by purchasing one of the books that I've written. You can find a list of those at colin.io. That's Colin with one L. And also very helpful is leaving a quick review for the show, wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everybody who is already supporting the show in some way, shape, or form. That means a whole lot. Thank you very much. The book that I'd like to recommend today is called Because Internet, Understanding the New Rules of Language by Gretchen McCulloch. This is an absolutely wonderful book, and if you get the chance, I actually highly suggest getting it in audiobook form, even if you don't typically listen to audiobooks, because the author reads it, and she reads it incredibly well, and that is vital for a book of this kind that gets into things like lol speak and emoji and the different ways people slam onto their keyboard to create different strings of text, and her voice modulation and pronunciation of all of these things is incredible, and she's just a delight to listen to. But the book itself, in whatever medium you happen to get it in, is incredibly informative, very well written, and if you're anything like me, it will introduce you to a collection of concepts that you are very superficially aware of and take you deep into them and give you a really useful understanding of the way that we communicate with each other today, using our various technologies and how some of these technologies developed and why they developed in the way that they did. So whether you are an enthusiastic user of internet speak, or if you're somebody who does not understand emoji and has no idea why they've become so popular, this is a very informative, useful, and entertaining book to pick up. Because Internet by Gretchen McCulloch. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find the show notes for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. And you can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com. Feel free to reach out and say howdy on your social network of choice. I am at Colin is my name on most of them. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.